So this is Strad from Zcash. And Strad is going to be doing a very high level introduction to zero knowledge proofs. Um, some of you might know this stuff, uh, some of you might not. But I think this is a great way to start this event. So thanks a lot. Right. Um, that has not updated. Oh. Ah, magic. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's cool. <laughs> right, yeah. So, hi, I'm Jack. I'm from Zcash, and I suck at cryptic crosswords. I, I just can't do them to save my life. Sometimes I even wonder if they even have solutions. So, oh, I fortunately have a friend who's really good at them. Um, but, you know, she likes to sort of tease me a bit. So, you know, I'll often ask her, you know, do you know the solution to some crossword that I'm having struggle, struggling with? What sort of things could she tell me in response? She could say, yeah, I know the solution. Well, well that's useful. Um, you know, that's going to tell me, OK, if I believe her, then, then there's a solution. But what if I don't trust her? What if she's yanking my chain? Um, she could say, here's the solution. But that's no fun. Like, you know, now, now I... Now I have the solution. I don't get to, like, bash my head against it for the next three days. Um, what we really want is the ability for her to prove that she knows the solution to the crossword that I'm trying to solve without actually revealing it. And so this is, funnily enough, where zero knowledge proof's coming. So the formal definition of this was back in 1985 from Goldwasser, Macaulay and Drakoff. Um, and they basically said that they, they looked into, um, at the time it was essentially, they were looking at soundness of proofs and um, essentially verifiers trying to ensure that provers couldn't lie to them. And then they then flipped it on its head, you know, the, the industry, and went, what happens if the verifier is malicious? And, you know, you want to make a proof but not actually, you know, give any information away other than that. So they formally defined that... To have what's called a zero-knowledge proof, it must have these certain properties. Specifically, completeness. So if the prover, in this case my friend Alice, ha is telling the truth, she can eventually convince me. Like, it might take some time, it might take some bandwidth, but eventually she can convince me that, yes, she does know the secret information. It must have soundness, which means that she can only convince me if she knows the valid solution. So that means that if, if she doesn't know the solution or if she knows an invalid solution, whatever, I can easily detect that and check that. Um, and then finally, she needs zero knowledgedness. Yes, this is the, what the papers calls it, uh, which is that I must learn absolutely nothing else other than she knows the solution. Or more generally, that whatever statement that she is proving is true, and that's it. Essentially, the least amount of information you could possibly leak. If we were leaking less information, then it, you know, that's one bit of information. If we were leaking less information, it would go back to a zero use, usefulness pro proof. <laughs> um, so let's see, okay, so how do these things actually work in practice? Um, the simplest example I can probably go through in a, a reasonable amount of time is uh, a very simple example using billiard balls. So imagine that my friend Alice is, um, you know, has these billiard balls, and she wants to prove to her friend Bob, um, who is colorblind, that the balls have different colors. Now, obviously, she can see them. Anyone who's not colorblind can s trivially see that the, that the balls have these colors. But Bob can't. To him, they look the same. They just, you know, they, they are random spheres. So we can design a protocol that enables Alice to prove to Bob that she knows that these have the same colour. Very simply. Bob takes the balls, puts them behind his back, and then shuffles them around a bit. Yeah. Essentially, he, he with 50% probability, like he flips a coin in his head, and if it lands on heads, he swaps them, and if it lands on tails, he doesn't. And he brings them back out. Now, to him, he knows that he made some particular swap, but he still can't see whether, you know, he still can't tell the difference between them. But Alice can. Alice can see, no, nope, you didn't do anything to it. So Bob goes, huh, goes back, 
does, a, does another permutation, brings them back out, and us can go, oh yeah, those were swapped. And you, know, you repeat this again and again, and you end up with essentially a zero knowledge proof um, at a very coarse interactive level. Um, it has completeness, so because it's a 50% probability, obviously you, you get compounding probabilities, and so if you repeat this n times, then the probability that, that Alice could have just been having a lucky guess every single time go, um, becomes essentially negligible. Uh, you get soundness because Bob knows whether he swapped them or not, so you know, he can easily check that. And finally, he gets zero knowledgedness, where you know, he's still colorblind, he still can't see that they are that they are distant colors, but he knows that, to all intents and purposes, they must be. And I want to sort of touch on this a little bit further. Um, Technically, zero-knowledgeness is slightly more complex than that. So let's say, um, so just going back to um, this point here. Um, so we have Bob. He now has gone through this protocol, and he is now convinced that Alice knows that they are different colors. So let's say Charlie comes along, and Charlie is also colorblind. And Charlie wants, is saying to Bob, are they, you know, wants to know if these are different colors. And go, Bob goes, yes, they are. Alice proved it to me. Well, well, now we're back at a, at a zero usefulness pro, um, proof. Yeah, that doesn't actually prove anything to Charlie. Charlie goes, why am I supposed to believe you? And Bob goes, oh, yes, but you see what happened here is I videoed the whole thing. So you can clearly see um, from the side, you know, you can see me swapping them or not swapping them. You see me with my hands. You can see that Alice can't see what I'm doing. And you can see, she, you can hear her saying, yes, they, you know, yes, they swapped or no, they didn't. And if you play the whole video through, then you can see, yep, she got it right every time. And Charlie goes, aha, but you could be lying to me. You could have either pre-negotiated with Alice to say, this is the order in which I'm going to do things before you started recording the video, and then the whole thing's a sham. Or it could have been an honest attempt, and Alice failed a few times, and you edited the video to remove the times that she failed. Now, to all intents and purposes, that looks the same as a valid run of the protocol where um, Alice could tell the balls apart. And this sort of gets at the core of what it means to have uh, zero knowledge proof. Um, if, if you imagine the real protocol as the, you know, a real recording of going through and you're seeing the, um, you see Alice you know, makes a distinguisher and that all happens, and then you put next to it a video that is entirely fabricated, that, you know, pr either by one of those two strategies, they look indistinguishable, essentially. So if you now imagine I have some machine learning algorithm that I can apply to the video and it extracts out um, the, the secret knowledge. You know, in, in, this, in this world, everything, everyone is colorblind, including algorithms except Alice. Yeah, just so pushing the metaphor a little bit far. Um, if I have that algorithm, and you know, so that I can extract information out of the, out of the real run, and the two runs are indistinguishable, then I should also be able to extract information out of the simulated run. But by definition, the simulated run contains no knowledge because it was a fake run. There was, there was no hidden input that was being proven. Which means that if, if, if all I can extract out of the simulated run is nothing, then therefore I cannot extract anything out of the real run. And that is, that is what we mean by zero knowledge. So that, that's the magic part that, that just is like so exciting. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> so, so what is it actually useful for? Um, so let's say, OK, we now have a zero knowledge proving system. Um, there's actually a really cool result which shows that if you have a zero knowledge proving system like billiard balls, you can convert it into any other zero knowledge proving system. So you could, it really, really, really inefficient, but you could use that to, to prove anything if you wanted to. So you know, we want, the best place for these kinds of things is where you have some system where you, you know, have private information or you have some information that you want to publicly verify. Where have we seen one of those before? It's, that's the gaudiest image I could find on the internet. Um, it's, 
yeah, a blockchain is a very good example of a case where we want to, we require, in fact, public verification of the system, but we would very much like to obscure most of the properties. And so, you know, I'm sure most people here know how a Bitcoin transaction looks, but you know that's essentially the at a block at a at a, at a high level the um, you know you have some inputs that reveal the values and you have outputs and then those outputs then chain to the inputs of new transactions and that chaining is the problem that's the that's the part where you uh, leaking your transaction graph and we can quite simply uh, I say simply it's not quite that simple. Um, as someone who bashed their head against this for best part of a year with six other engineers. Um, but the, you can essentially replace the outputs of your transaction, which previously were a value in an address, with essentially a commitment to, a, to some private information. And then in your next transaction when you spend it, you provide a zero-knowledge proof that proves knowledge of that private information and also that it all satisfies the consensus rules of the chain. Um, there are other talks I could go into um, to get more in detail about that, but I will leave it at that for now. Um, yeah, there are many other uses of, of this kind of thing. Um, you know, verifiable auctions, for instance. So um, people contributing private bids, and then you want the whole, uh, then you want obviously the, the winner to come out without necessarily revealing um, to, to other parties who was actually doing bids. Uh, verifiable voting, you can ima imagine uses for that in, in governments and uh, um, general voting, voting systems. Smart contracts, I think a few of you might have applications there. Um, and even authentication mechanisms. You know, your basic, you, know, you submit a password to a website. You, know, you don't want to give them your password. And you can think of you know, proving a pre-image of a hash as a, you know, a very basic, in a way, kind of, kind of proof. And you know, plenty of other things. So of course, you know, I'm sure that's leaving you on how these things actually work in practice. Unfortunately, that's, that's, that's not my problem with this talk. <laughs> uh, what I will do here is um, give you some references. So this first one is a really nice uh, paper um, um, by Kiskata and Tal, who um, they explained it in terms of Alibaba's cave. So, you know, the, the tale of going in, you know, the, the cave with magic password and essentially, you know, you can escape the thieves because you know the secret to get through the back door, whereas other people can't. And essentially proving knowledge of that secret without revealing the secret to anyone. Uh, likewise, Matt Green has a really nice illustrated primer using um, uh, the graph coloring problem, tiny bowler hats and time machines. So it's really, it's really worth a read and sort of explains the same sort of thing I've gone through here. And finally, if you're actually looking for a, a place to sort of find resources on, on zero knowledge proofs, I've started up a website, zkp.science, uh, where I, at the moment it's just sort of a grab bag of all the zero knowledge proofing systems I can find and implementations and um, DSLs and things. Uh, eventually, I'm hoping to get some, you know, start getting like benchmarks of different systems under different loads, so so, in, so people who are implementing these things can actually start um, you know, making decisions of like what trade-offs they want in their proving systems and other things like that. Uh, yeah, I'll leave leave it there. Um, if anyone's got any questions, then go for it. Otherwise, thank you. I'm on the problem mic. There we go. Does, does anybody have any questions? So we want to do some Q&A. There will just... So you said that proof was 2 to the 2, 5, 6, or you didn't say the exact number, but it was probabilistic rather than absolute. Is that always the case with zero knowledge proofs? Or do you get ones that are kind of axiomatically true? Um, in, in general, yes. They, so like the canonical example of a, which you may have heard of a ZK snark, um, the, S the SNARK stands for succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. So it's, a, so it's specifically a, you know, a probabilistic proof. Uh, I am not aware of any proof systems that, um, that are incontrovertible um, for, the, for the simple reason that you, know, you could essentially, with an with a, you know, infinitely powerful computer, you could, you could generate a, a, a proof string that happens to validate the, um, the system. The, Yes, that's, that's why essentially you can tune these to, you can tune that level essentially to, to what you require. Um, 
there's, there's some really actually nice stuff about ZK Snarks, which, I, which um, mean that you actually don't need that many um, things in order for it to be uh, effectively secure. Uh, but yes, essentially, it's, that is one of the things that you essentially are sort of giving up when you're trying to do this kind of thing, because yeah, you, you can't ever be absolutely sure, certain, but then like, you can't ever be absolutely certain that AES isn't broken. It's just like very, very, very unlikely. All right. Um, so we actually, I'll just jump back on the stage. Um, thank you so much for this talk, by the way.